Right, so good morning to you all and a very warm welcome to the house. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Natalie Kendall. I am a theologian and the founder of the house, which is a house church based in the north of England. Um, we have been on hiatus for the past few weeks. Uh, last week, Viv was kind enough to um, lead things out for us and share a message. I'd like to thank her for her excellent work. She is joining us slightly later as she's doing something else this morning. Um, as you can probably tell, the plans which were originally made for last week for the 3rd of October, um, they were pushed forward, so they're going to be happening this week. Uh, so what do we have on the menu for this morning? Um, we will be exploring a story found in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 4. We will be sharing some music together, so you can sing along if you want to. And um, we will also be talking to God together as well this morning. So that's what you can expect. Uh, but first thing, I have a few important pieces of information I'd like to share with you, some of which uh, directly concerns the house. So I'll just get the screen share up and going. And we'll just have a look at a few pieces of information on what is happening in the next uh, coming weeks. So uh, number one, uh, Viv, as I said, will be joining us. She will be my co-host for today. Um, as mentioned, she's running a bit late due to a prior engagement, but generally if you have any issues uh, during this event, just send her a little message in the chat and she is more likely to uh, see your message before I am. Information point number two uh, concerns this afternoon. We are in uh, hosting an event called the Train Ride Adventure. It's the first in a series which we're calling Adventure Time. It is hosted by the house and will take place here on Zoom as well. Uh, the idea behind Adventure Time stems from, we realize many people are unable to travel, um, unable to visit new locations, and even sometimes unable to get out of the house. And because of this, we're inviting you along for a a virtual online adventure uh, from time to time on Sabbath afternoons. So for this week's adventure, um, we are boarding a train in Norway. We are taking a cozy and scenically stunning journey from the small town of Ål in the mountains to the city of Bergen on the west coast. So you can come along for this journey. Um, and we'll do what you might do on a train journey. You mean listen to music, we can have a chat, you can just sit in quiet and um, watch the goats pass by your window, um, eat snacks. We might even bring a book along to read out loud. Um, so it's going to be, I think, a really cozy adventure and something to look forward for. Um, just a second, I need to give access to someone here and sadly zoom is a little bit tricky because it hides your uh, <laughs> it hides your cursor when you're doing screen share but there we go um yeah so come along for this afternoon if you'd like we're going to board the train at 4 p.m and you can use the same access code uh, for zoom which you used this morning to join us at shabbat at the house Information point number three concerns social media. Um, I'd like to kindly encourage you all to um, consult our Facebook page um, for information. It'll allow you to stay updated on events and if there are any changes in plans. Um, as you can imagine, this is very useful for me and Viv because um, if 10 people write us the same question in a week, that means us having to answer 10 messages. And uh, it's a little bit easier if you try to consult our Facebook page. And we now have a new Instagram account. So if you're not on Facebook, you can pop over to Instagram. We post most of what we're doing on there. And that is not to say that you can't message us if you don't um, find the information you're looking for. 
but have a look there. Uh, you will see the QR code for um, our Instagram account on the screen. And on to point number four, concerns monthly calendar, right? Um, you're going to see in your chat on your right hand side a little bit later uh, that I have uploaded or will upload a document called the House Events Calendar um, October 2020. Um, so when you open this document, what you'll see is uh, something like this. Um, here you'll be able basically to plan a bit more long term, um, see what's going on, see what we have going on in the afternoon and any special events we may have planned for the next, well, not for the next month, but for this month of October. Um, I'm hoping that this will help you to be able to plan your life a bit better um, avoid missing out if you wanted to join into something. Uh, for example, you can see where it says 10th of October. Um, here you can see what's happening today, Shabbat at the house from 11 and the train ride adventure from 4. I'd like to highlight a couple of things on this calendar. Um, from the next week and for the coming two weeks, we will be having a theme at the house our theme is disability awareness. We're aiming to uh, raise awareness about disabilities in various facets of life, um, to encourage a better understanding and also to become better allies for people with disabilities. So our theme will run like a red thread through the Bible stories that we're going to be looking at and also a series, as you can see, of afternoon seminars and talks by various guests. Um, so as you can see next week, 17th of October, our Bible exploration begins from 11 in the morning as usual, um, and is titled The Lame, the Blind and the Deaf, uh, where we will be looking at a series of Bible stories. And then in the afternoon, uh, Vivi will be presenting a talk on deaf culture and bridging and uh, the culture between the deaf community and the hearing community through awareness. The following week, we continue the second part of our disability awareness series. Um, you'll see that we'll look at a story in Mark 5. And then in the afternoon, I myself will be sharing a talk on uh, living with chronic illness, particularly in the time of COVID-19 from 4 p.m. Um, and finally, I'd just like to point out as well, we have a very special event called Reformation Day Celebration. Um, you can pop down to the bottom there. It will start on the 31st of October from 6 p.m. So that Sabbath actually lands on, on um, Halloween this year, and I thought we could make it into a special event um, where we'll be looking at a bit of the history of... Um, the Reformation, and, uh, and also have some music together. So you can pop some of those things in your diary. And as said, I will send you that document so, uh, so you'll be able to download it. And uh, the last and final point of information, I'd like to thank our patrons today, Sharon Milliard and Vivi Pomfil, who hasn't quite joined us yet. Um, they are he helping make Shabbat at the house and other similar events possible thanks to their support. Um, if you feel like we're doing something worthwhile and you're thinking about maybe becoming a patron yourself, you can see the link there on the screen and uh, we'd love for you to be a patron too. Right, so with that information out of the way, uh, we're going to kick things off this morning um, by singing a song together. It is called We Open Our Bibles Again. I'm going to get the lyrics up on the screen in just a second so you can join in and sing along if you want to.
So let's do just that. Let's uh, open our Bibles. If you want to follow along the story today, you can go grab your Bible or look up one online. Um, either way, we will have the Bible text up on the screen so you'll be able to follow along. I'll get that up in just a moment. Right, so we'll jump straight into things this morning by turning to 1 Samuel chapter 4. Now, last week we revisited a story found a bit later in the timeline of this narrative in chapter 7. And that story, some of you may remember, was called Ebenezer's. But this week we are looking at something which happened prior to chapter 7, a sort of prologue to the story. Now, to best understand these events, uh, we must understand the context of this narrative. And the context is that the Israelite people live in the land of Canaan, but they aren't the only ones there. They are surrounded by other peoples. 
And one of these peoples are called the Philistines. Now, the Philistines lived in their land, as you can see on the map, called Philistia. And if you're at all familiar with some of the Old Testament stories, you'll know that the Philistines were some of Israel's biggest and bitterest enemies during this period. The Philistines and the Israelites were constantly battling each other and fighting over the border which divided their lands. Now, with that in mind, today we enter just such a story. Let's begin reading 1 Samuel chapter 4, 1 to 3, where it says, Now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel, and as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. I'm just going to quickly add someone here, and then we'll carry on. Sharon, could I possibly uh, make you my co-host, and then you can add people? Great. So I don't need to keep doing this. Thanks a lot. All right. So um, this is quite a different outcome than maybe they'd hoped for and maybe we'd hoped for or expect. The Israelites in this battle are defeated and 4,000 men killed. And it appears that we aren't the only ones who are surprised at this outcome, as we read from verse 3. When the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? So it appears the elders of Israel, those considered leaders or in positions of authority, are asking the same question, why did this happen? They decide that they need to fix the situation. And how do they do that? We read that in the end of verse 3. The elders then say, Let us bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh so that we may go out, so that he may go out with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. We are told in this story that the ark of the covenant is being kept in a place called Shiloh. Now, if you're not familiar with the Ark of the Covenant, it refers to a particular box of great historical and spiritual importance to the Israelites. It was a wooden box, which God had commanded the Israelites make earlier in the Sinai Desert. And inside this box were kept tablets of stone on which were written the terms of God's relationship with Israel. It would have looked a bit like this, as you can see on the picture, men would lift this box using the poles on each side. And on top of the box, if you can see, there's a sort of lid on which sat two angel figures called cherubim. But this ark is not just any old box. It has a specific purpose, a purpose that all of Israel would have been aware of. And the purpose of this box is to serve as a throne. God's throne on earth. Since the time of Moses, 500 years earlier, God had said to the Israelites, I want to live among you. So he had a tent built for him among all the tents of the people. And inside that tent was this ark, the ark of the covenant. Above this box, between the angels on the lid, God was there as though sitting as a king on his throne. With this in mind, we can understand a bit more of what's happening in 1 Samuel 4. The Israelites are beaten by their enemies and the elders say, go, get the Ark of the Covenant. In other words, get the throne of God and bring it here. But it's more than that because if you think about it practically, if a king is sitting on his throne and you carry the throne somewhere, Guess what? The assumption is the king is coming along as well. The elders are thinking, if we bring God's throne here, he too will come. And if he comes, then we'll win. Verse 4. 
So the people sent men to Shiloh, and they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. Now, right here seems like a good move. It isn't, isn't that what we say, that we shouldn't face challenges or battles without facing it together with God? In many ways, you can say the Israelites are doing the right thing. They are saying, we lost, but if we bring God with us, we'll win. And you can tell where their minds are at and what their expectations are by the next verse, verse 5. When the ark of the Lord's covenant came into the camp, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Now, these days, we don't get a lot of outright battles happening in the West. It's unlikely you've woken up one morning to hear the sound of uh, roaring armies getting ready for battle in your local park. But perhaps the closest thing that we come to this experience is during football matches. At large football games in these great stadiums, you get that epic sound where thousands of fans are roaring and shouting together. If you're a football fan at all, um, you'll know that each club and sometimes each national team has a specific chant or a specific song that they tend to use. In the Euro Cup of uh, 2016, one team in particular gained um, international recognition for their chant, and that was the Icelandic team. You may remember this if you followed along in the tournament, seeing these burly, shirtless Icelandic fans. They're standing in their pews, arms raised above their head, murder in their eyes, um, clapping, grunting loudly to the beat of a drum. The chant they enacted was called the Skull Chant, and it really captured audiences everywhere as it was dramatic and it looked and sounded truly intimidating. You can almost get the feeling that they really were ancient Vikings revving up for battle. And you can't really blame a poor, pale, chips-loving Englishman for perhaps shaking a bit in his football boots. Well, as the Ark is brought into the camp at Ebenezer that day, the Israelites shout. And they shouted so loudly, the text said, as we saw, the ground shook. I think we can safely say that despite their defeat earlier, the Israelites' confidence has now returned to them. As is the case um, with the Icelandic fans, now the Israelites' shouts catch the attention of their opponents. Verse 6. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines asked, what's all this shouting in the Hebrew camp? When they learned that the Ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. A god has come into the camp, they said. Oh no, nothing like this has happened before. We're doomed. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Be strong, Philistines. Be men, or you will sub be subject to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. It appears that despite their earlier victory, the Philistines are truly shaken by what a turn of events the Israelites seem to be having. They don't sound like defeated men. They don't sound like losers, and the Philistines, despite their earlier victory, are having to psych themselves up and out of their fear to carry on. Interestingly, and you may have noticed this, they seem to have heard about Israel's run-in with Egypt. The legend of the Israelites' God which fought for them seems to have survived even 500 years after the Exodus. Well, this story seems to be turning around. Let's see what happens. Verse 10. So the Philistines fought and the Israelites were defeated, and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers, 
The Ark of God was captured and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Not quite what we may expect. Not exactly what we may have thought would happen. And clearly not what the Israelites thought would happen. What on earth had gone wrong? After all, they'd brought the Ark of the Covenant. They thought God would be with them in battle. So how had they just suffered such a disastrous loss? Only a few lines earlier, the Israelites were shouting for victory. Enough noise to scare their enemy. But among all those voices and all the noise in this story, there's one sound we don't hear. There's one voice which is absent from this narrative, and that is God's voice. In those days, the Ark of the Covenant was not just kept at Shiloh for any old reason. Shiloh was located about 30 miles north of Jerusalem, and here the Ark of God was kept permanently in a tent which stayed put since the days of Joshua by God's command. The tent was not moved around in those 500 years. The Ark didn't move around either. But in 1 Samuel 4, it is moved. The Israelites move it. They pick it up and bring it to them. Now, a question to ask is, is God consulted at any point in this story? No. Again, keep in mind, this wasn't just moving a box around. This is an attempt to move God around, to carry him where we want him to go. And at no point is he asked or consulted or even talked to. He's just picked up and carried. In this story, we don't find the Israelite army going to God and asking him for help. Instead, what we find is the Ark of the Covenant being treated like a lucky rabbit's foot. This will bring us good luck, they say. This will bring us good fortune. And nobody at any point is recorded as actually talking to God. They just pick up his throne and say, right, you're coming with us and you will act as we please. You will go where we say and fight the way that we want you to. In other words, that day, the Israelites assumed it is possible to manipulate and control God and that they could do so by controlling the box which he had chosen to use as a throne on earth. The assumption here is that having God's box there meant by default that they have his alliance and also his cooperation. In short, the Israelites believe that God could be contained, a God in a box. So that is the first thing which stands out in this story. And the second thing is who brings the box to the camp? Now, when the ark was brought, we are told as readers in verse end of verse 4, and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. Eli was a priest in Israel. At the time, he would have served before the Ark of the Covenant, and he made sacrifices for the sins of the people there at Shiloh. But he had two sons, and Eli made these two sons to serve as priests in God's tent as well. Eli's two sons are men mentioned, as we said, as accompanying and perhaps even carrying the ark to the battlefield at Ebenezer. And it can seem at first glance as though this little piece of information is an unimportant detail. And these two characters are equally trivial. But this is not the first time that Eli's two sons pop up in the story of 1 Samuel. Earlier in the book, in chapter 2, from verse 12, they appear and they are described as the following. Scoundrels, adulterers, using their position of power to bully and act in a corrupt way. And the text also records that they use the meat of the animal sacrifices, which were meant to be offered for the people's sins, as their own personal snack. The story says that they would come by where an other priest was sacrificing and say, give us the meat to eat. And if the priest who was doing the sacrifices said, um, 
no, that's not what this is for, Eli's sons would say, give it to us or we'll take it by force. In short, Eli's two sons clearly had no respect for the service of the priests or for the presence of God in the tent. And now they are the ones bringing God's throne with them to the battlefield. At first, this story looks one way, but as we look closer, it looks another way. God and his throne are being treated with no honor, even a basic respect, and the Israelites think God is a lucky charm to be controlled. Well, we read that the battle ends pretty much in disaster, but it comes to the pinnacle in verse 11, where it says, and the ark of God was captured. So not only does Israel suffer a great military defeat that day, but the ark of the covenant is taken. Chapter 5, verse 1. After the Philistines had captured the ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. The Philistines, they take the Ark of the Covenant to their own land, to Philistia. Now, to an Israelite, this is ultimate defeat. Why? Because, if, as we've established, the Ark of the Covenant is not just any old box. It is the throne of God on earth, above which God's presence is located. And so, in the Hebrew mindset, God is no longer in Israel. He has gone away. No worse, he has been taken away. When word of this gets back to Eli the priest, the shock for him is very great. And his daughter-in-law, who also hears the news, goes into early labor and calls her newborn son Ichabod, which in Hebrew means the glory has departed. Now, the word in Hebrew for glory is Shekinah. Shekinah is a word which is used to describe the presence of God. This is because God's presence and the glory of God is the same thing. His presence and his glory are the same. And now the Shekinah has departed from Israel's land. God has been kidnapped. Again, in the mind of the Israelites, this means ultimate defeat because it wasn't a matter of being beaten by their enemies. Their God had been captured, which meant to them and in the eyes of the Philistines, not only was the Israelite army defeated, but the Israelite God was defeated. For surely no God can be taken away against his will. In Philistia, there are five big cities, and one of these cities is called Ashdod. It is here to Ashdod that the Ark of God is taken, and we read in chapter 5, verse 2, Then they carried the Ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. So God's kidnappers um, bring his throne into what is called Dagon's temple. Now, Dagon was one of the gods of the Philistines, Specifically, he was the god of grain. And by default, this means he's a very important god because he's the god of food, and that implies fertility and life and abundance. Now, this right here is a huge power move. The Philistines say not only is the Israelite god defeated, but we will put him before our god, Dagon. This wasn't to say we see you as equals. It is an act of humiliation. Here, Hebrew God, bow down to our God who is clearly your superior. Now, the Israelites may have treated God with disrespect, dishonoring the place he lived, his sacrifices, and carrying him against his will by two corrupt men. But in Philistia, things are very different for a God. For you see, in Philistia, they really knew how to treat a deity. Each morning, the people would rise early and go into the temple. There, Dagon's image was a stone statue, and the people would get busy caring for him. Each morning, they would bathe the statue, feed the statue with their best food. They would burn incense, say prayers to it, douse it in perfume, and expensive oils. It was like a spa in there, a five-star treatment. 
Take note, Israel, this is how you treat a god. Well, it's a good day in Philistia, and this particular morning, the people of Ashdod must have woken up with a smile on their faces and a spring in their step. After all, it was very recently that they won a battle against Israel. And as was customary, they go to the Temple of Dagon to give him his manicure and his continental breakfast. But lo and behold, something has happened in the course of the night. Verse 3. When the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, there was Dagon, fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and put him back in his place. Oh, that's odd. Oh no, what has happened, say the people? Well, let's pop him back in his place. Verse 4. But the following morning, when they rose, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. His head and hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. That is why to this day neither the priests of Dagon nor any others who enter Dagon's temple at Ashdod step on the threshold. So the first morning's unfortunate events may have seemed like an accident. There was a strong wind and Dagon's statue blew over. But the second morning, the citizens of Ashdod find Dagon had again fallen on his face in front of the ark. But this time, his head and hands are broken off. Imagine the horror at the sight. In their eyes, their god is found to be prostrated before the ark and therefore is being seen as bowing and worshipping the god of the Israelites. This would be extremely puzzling to them because in their eyes, Dagon had just defeated the Israelites on the battlefield and they had captured the ark, so it was clearly defeated. Why is Dagon worshipping his defeated enemy? But the shamefulness of this event doesn't stop here, because as we read, the people of Ashdod find Dagon's statue's hands and head were broken off. Now, in the ancient Near East, the hands and the head are the most honourable part of the body. When it came to executions, beheading is viewed as the least honourable death you can have, and the removal of hands is also extremely shameful. So not only is Dagon bowing down to his enemy, but he is visually been beheaded and de-handed. And it doesn't stop there. We read in the text that his head and hands were not lying where his body was, but were lying on the threshold of the temple. Um, now, if this is a foreign word to you, threshold simply refers to that piece of often wood which lies at the bottom of your door arch. So you cross over it when you enter or exit a room. And in those days outside of Israel, there was something called threshold sacrifices, which were very common practices. A threshold sacrifice worked a bit like this. A small bowl would be carved into the threshold of ancient homes or temples. And when an important guest was coming and going to visit you at that house or temple, an animal would be sacrificed on the threshold and the blood of the animal would pour into the bowl. This would be a, a way to signal respect and also to honor the guest who was coming. And then after the visitor had arrived, you would then cook and eat the animal which was sacrificed. And so, with that understanding, what the inhabitants of Ashdod see that morning is their god Dagon has been sacrificed in the doorway of his house in order to, in order to honor the guest, the god of the Israelites. Dagon has not only been shamed into worshiping another god, a defeated god, but now he has been executed in the most painfully shameful way in his own home like an animal. And what he does there is interesting. God really seems to be 
having an adventure abroad. What he does stands in stark contrast with how the Philistines viewed gods and how they work. Remember, in their minds, the god idols must be bathed, must be fed, must be prayed to, and cared for. But the god of the Israelites seems to be doing just fine by himself. A moment ago, we thought he was kidnapped and defeated, but now he appears to be quite capable of dealing with his kidnappers. And the misery of the Philistines doesn't end there. They find themselves being afflicted with wasting tumors and crop-eating rats. Now, wasting tumors is a type of cancer which causes dramatic weight loss because it feeds on the food which you eat. And the rats with the, uh, which the people of Philistia began struggling with were eating all the wheat and crops in their fields. In other words, their food. Verse 7. When the people of Ashdod saw what was happening, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not stay here with us because his hand is heavy on us and on Dagon our God. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and asked them, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, Have the ark of the God of Israel moved to Gath? So they moved the ark of the God of Israel. So here the people of Ashdod say to their leaders, look, we can't have the ark here. And the rulers say, well, move it then. So they move it to the second of the great five cities of Philistia. But here the same thing happens to the citizens there. And the people of Gath try to send it on to a third of their five great cities, to Ekron. But those living in Ekron have learned what is happening. And they're like, no, you're not bringing that in here. And so chapter 6, verse 1, tells us that the ark of God has been in Philistine territory seven months now. Actually, the original language says, and the ark of the Lord was in the field of the Philistines for seven new moons or seven months. No city or town in Philistia wants the ark to enter their town. And so the ark is left in a field outside any city or town, in a field. Wherever the ark goes, people are uh, struggling with tumors, which cause them to be beleaguered and starving, and their crops are destroyed by rats. And now finally, God sits in a field. A field is Dagon's domain. He is the God of crops, if you remember, of bounty. And for seven months, an enemy God is sitting in his territory and Dagon doesn't do a thing about it. This adds to the shame. Not only couldn't Dagon protect himself or the people who worshipped him, he is also shown to be utterly impotent in his cosmic functional domain, a field of crops the people who seemingly captured God are now desperate to get rid of him. Finally, after the ark sits in a field for up to seven months, the Philistines again call together their leaders and say, we need to send this box back. Let's send it back to Israel with gifts attached to it. And they say, verse four, perhaps he, that is the Israelite God, will lift his hand from you and your gods and your land, why do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh did? When Israel's God dealt harshly with them, did they not send the Israelites out so they could go on their way? So the leaders of Philistia are saying, don't be like the Egyptians of old. They couldn't control Israel's God, so let's not destroy ourselves in the attempt to. What ends up happening is that they, play, <clears throat> they place the ark on a cart pulled by cows. And they basically just let the cows walk by themselves, pulling the ark behind them. And from a distance, they watch the cart thinking, please go back to Israel. Verse 12. Then the cows went straight up towards Beth Shemesh, which is in Israel near the border of Philistia, 
keeping on the road and mooing all the way. They did not turn to the right or to the left. The rulers of the Philistines followed them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. Now the Israelites living in Beth Shemesh were out in the field harvesting wheat. And what a surprise they are in for because pulled by cows, this is what happens. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were harvesting their wheat in the valley. And when they looked up and saw the ark, they rejoiced at the sight. End of verse 15. On that day, the people of Beth Shemesh offered burnt sacrifices and made sacrifices sorry, burnt offerings and made sacrifices to the Lord. The five rulers of the Philistines saw all this and they returned the same day to Ekron. At the return of the Ark of the God of Israel, the hard times are lifted from Philistia. And this concludes the story of when God went abroad to Philistia. Now, in a way, um, this may seem like a jarring, confusing, puzzling story to some of us. We may wonder what on earth shall we make of this narrative? Well, there is one thing that we can deduce from this story, and that is that the God of Israel does not seem to be like the other gods. If we look at Dagon in this story, similarly to the other gods in the Near East. He was dependent on human help to be cared for, prayed to, fed, and so on. While the God of Israel, even when he seems controlled by the Israelites and kidnapped by the Philistines, he seems utterly independent and powerfully capable. Now, this may seem comforting to some, but may seem frightening to others. Because we tend to assume that what cannot be controlled also cannot be trusted, cannot be dependable or good. But if you notice in this story, the inability, of, the inability to box or control God is because he is not like the other gods. If Dagon is dependent and impotent and able to do nothing, God is powerful, alive, and acting. We humans, we tend to want both things. We want a God who is both controllable to us and also a God who is powerful enough to do what we cannot do. But if God is to be big enough to act outside the constrictions of our problems, he also has to be bigger than we are. In fact, he has to be bigger than us if he is to be a God. This story reminds us um, maybe of how easy it is, even today, to attempt to box God. To say, well, God has come to be close to us in this context, or in this way, or in this group of people. And so he is now only able to exist inside these parameters. He is contained by them. We could say things like, or think things like, he only responds to prayers when we use this formula. He will only show up in these buildings, or he will act only in a certain way if we sing these songs, or we paint our church walls in this color, or dress in this way, or are part of this denomination. Now, this type of thinking may lead us to take things which he uses as tools to communicate and to reach us in our context and turn them into superstitious ornaments we think we can constrain. And that's really one of the major problems with superstition. It's the act of believing you can control things outside your power through rituals or by doing or saying things in a certain way. Like, for example, bringing God's throne to the battlefield or crossing yourself and thinking this somehow brings you good fortune or saying certain words and phrases, having certain routines, enacting certain liturgy, thinking that somehow these mean that we can inadvertently manipulate one who is greater than us. But could it be 
that if we want help from God, we need only ask? Could it be that him helping us and being near us comes down to who he is and not what we make him do? It would seem that relationship is the antithesis of, um, of superstition. It's its opposite. Because superstition is centered around power and manipulation and control, while relationship is communicating in honesty and respecting freedom of choice. And lastly, could it be this story holds a mild warning for us that just as rituals don't bend the will of God, neither do our outer performances. Our outward performances do not compensate for inward corruption. Even these days, I have sat in church board meetings where the entire hour I'm there, uh, those sat around the table are doing nothing but attacking each other, gossiping, putting people down, interrupting each other, and covering up for corporate corruption, and completely lacking in love. And yet it is believed by those around the table that if we only open and close that board meeting with a prayer, that God's allegiance is somehow granted to us, and it's assumed God is leading us. Because we said the magic words, because we brought the magic box because we went to church on Saturday, because we pray three times a day, or because we have 10 Bibles in our house, because we do missionary work. It would seem that based on 1 Samuel and in so many other narratives in the Bible, God leads and helps and rescues despite us, despite us and because of his kindness. And he invites us to have a relationship with him outside of the confines of the boxes we may create for him because he's so much bigger and so much better than that to conclude this thought we are going to sing a song together called no liturgy and again i'll get the lyrics up on the screen in just a second
we are going to speak together with God now to one who thankfully never gets tired um, of hearing us, never gets tired of helping us. And we have the pleasure of being led out in prayer by Amy this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that we could all get together on this Sabbath morning and hear the word today. I pray that um, you help us to remember that you're always there for us and that all we need to do is talk to you and ask to you. And I pray that we continue to strengthen our relationship to you based on respect and honesty. And please look after us, help us have a good Sabbath and please continue to pour your blessings upon us and forgive us for our wrongdoings too. And help us to try and spread the word about you, letting our friends and family know about you as well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 Thank you so much, Amy. Appreciate that. Um, we are going to uh, sing one song as an extension of uh, the message and also speaking with God, our final song called The Mighty One. You may notice that the final um, chorus in this song is in Norwegian. It's not a typing error, um, but you can sing it in English alongside. So here's your opportunity to learn some Norwegian on the fly. So I'll get the lyrics up in just a second.
So that is it for today at Shabbat at the house. I'd like to remind everyone we're back here at 4 p.m. for our train ride adventure. You can use the exact same Zoom access code uh, to join us at 4. I'd also like to remind you that uh, the house is a proud supporter of the Equal Justice Initiative. Uh, this is an organization which works to end mass incarceration, excessive punishment and racial inequality in the US. So it's connected to the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, so if you have any coins, you know, you're willing to part with or you were keeping for offering, um, I'm going to put the link in the chat and um, you can go and support them if you want to. I'd like to thank you all for your valuable time and attention uh, today. And if you want to stay behind and chat for a few minutes, you're most welcome to. And uh, hopefully we'll see you this afternoon. Otherwise, I hope you have a very good remainder of your day. Good morning, Vivi. I see that you were able to join us in the end, which is awesome. I don't know if you can hear me or if you're busy elsewhere, but. And Shiron, thank you so much for your help as co-host today. I really appreciated that. Thank you. You're welcome. How are you doing this morning? I'm good. Great. Yeah. I uh, I keep wanting to say how are things in Tilburg? Till, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's correct. <laughs> I remember this time. <laughs> I was looking at the address yesterday, and I was like, "Oh yeah, he's from Tilburg." It, you said that that's on the board, no, close to the border of Belgium. Belgium. Yes. So you get good chocolate. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And the Bryans. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, um, Amy is my lovely niece. <laughs> and Des is married to, is her mom and married to um, my husband's brother, Brian. And uh, they're called the Simons as well, but I call them the Bryans to <laughs> differentiate between the different families. And then um, my husband's other brother michael i call them the michaels so just to explain that amy thank you so much for praying for us this morning i really appreciated that it's okay <laughs> you guys have any any plans for today you might come try and come to the train journey because it sounds really interesting oh great yeah that would be fun to have you and of course, if you fall asleep between now and then, that's fine too. <laughs> I know Derek will definitely want to be having a nap, but um, I don't know if he can. But yeah. All oh, right. Today it was really good. Oh, thank you very much. I'm glad. I'm very glad. I'm just trying to um, upload this. Oh, hello, Vivi. I'm trying to upload this calendar for you if I can find it. Hello, Sandy. Hello. Hello, Desmond, and hello, Amy. Amy. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> we saw each other five, six, five years ago. Six years ago. Yeah, five years. Five years ago, I think. Five years ago. Yeah. Five years ago. <laughs> yeah. At, is that the last time you saw each other at the wedding? At the wedding, the first and last year. <laughs> nice is the mountain towards the center of norway yes it is ted i don't know if you have good uh knowledge of norway's geography or if you've done your homework but yeah <laughs> it is um i used to live very close to where we'll start off and then we'll travel sort of from the center of norway to the west coast to bergen 
for those of you who don't know, Ted is a very big fan of Bergen as a city. So that's close to his heart. All right, I've uh, uploaded the house events calendar for anyone who's interested in in downloading that. And I'll also pop it on the on the Facebook page in case someone missed it. Thank you, Nat. That's great. You're very you? welcome. Yeah. When did you arrive? I didn't see. Well, I I arrived at quarter to twelve, and then I had a call from I had a call from a supervisor, oh. so I had to take it. I had to just like mute everything and just be like, hello. <laughs> um, and then I literally just got back. Yeah. Hmm. Well, it's very nice to have you. Oh, it is. And I have recorded today as well. I saw it's still recording now. So I'm just like, yay. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me actually yeah. stop that. <laughs>